ดีนี่ก็อะไรสุดดีโค้ชทรีบอเนาะทรีโกลงนี่ดาอนาวซ้องยัดยောက်เลยบอเนาะดีนี่อ่ะเลทาลีนะคู่ไปชื่อบาเ
Um, and one of the problems is that, you know, the person approaching a turnstile can approach from lots of different directions. So they can be in this green position to get in the blue position. You know, and sometimes they're closer to the camera, so they appear bigger in the image. And sometimes they're already closer to the camera, so their face appears much bigger. So what is actually done to build these turnstiles is not to just take the raw image and feed it to a neural net to try to figure out the person's identity. Instead, the best approach today seems to be a multi-step approach, where first, you run one piece of software to detect the person's face. So there's first a detector to figure out where's the person's face. Having detected the person's face, you then zoom in to that part of the image. And crop that image so that the person's face is centered then it is this picture, like as I drew here in red, this is then fed to a neural network to then try to learn or estimate the person's identity. And what researchers have found is that instead of trying to learn everything on one step, by breaking this problem down into two simpler steps, first is figure out where's the face, and second is look at the face and figure out who this actually is, the second approach allows the learning algorithm, or really two learning algorithms to solve two much simpler tasks and results in overall better performance. By the way, if you want to know how the second step actually works, I've simplified the discussion. By the way, if you want to know how step two here actually works, I've actually simplified the description a bit. The way the second step is actually trained is you train a neural network that takes as input two images. And uh, what the neural network does is it takes as input two images and it tells you if these two are the same person or not. So if you then have, say, 10,000 employees' IDs on file, you can then take this image in red and quickly compare it against maybe all 10,000 employee IDs on file to try to figure out if this picture in red is indeed one of your 10,000 employees that you should allow into this facility or that you should allow into your office building. Um, if this is a turnstile that you know, is giving employees access to a workplace. So why is it that the two-step approach works better? There are actually two reasons for that. One is that each of the two problems you're solving is actually much simpler. But second is that you have a lot of data for each of the two subtasks. In particular, there is a lot of data you can obtain for face detection for task one over here, where the task is to look at an image and figure out you know, where is the person's face in the image. So there is a lot of data for there is a lot of labeled data x comma y where x is a picture and y shows the position of the person's face. So you could build a neural network to do task one quite well. And then separately, there's a lot of data for task two as well. Um, today, leading companies have, let's say, hundreds of millions of pictures of people's faces. So given a closely cropped image, like this red image or this one down here, Today, leading face recognition teams have, you know, at least hundreds of millions of images that they could use to look at two images and try to figure out the identity or figure out if it's the same person or not. So there's also a lot of data for task two. But in contrast, if you were to try to learn everything at the same time, there is much less data of the form x comma y, where x is an image like this taken from a turnstile and y is the identity of a person. So because you don't have enough data to solve this end-to-end -end learning problem, but you do have enough data to solve sub-problems one and two, in practice, breaking this down to two sub-problems results in better performance than a pure end-to-end -end deep learning approach. Although if you had enough data for the end-to-end -end approach, maybe the end-to-end -end approach would work better, but that's not actually what works best in practice today. Let's look at a few more examples. Take machine translation. Traditionally, machine translation systems also had a long, complicated pipeline where you first take, say, English text and then do text analysis, basically extract a bunch of features off the text and so on. And after many, many steps, you then output, say, a uh, translation of the English text into French. Because for machine translation, you do have a lot of pairs of English, comma, French sentences, end-to-end -end deep learning works quite well for machine translation. And that's because today, it is possible to get a large data set of x, y pairs, where that's the English sentence, and that's the corresponding French translation. So this example, end-to-end -end deep learning, works well. One last example, 
let's say that you want to look at an x-ray picture of a hand of a child and estimate the age of a child. You know, when I first heard about this problem, I thought this is a very cool crime scene investigation task where uh, you find maybe tragically a skeleton of a child and you want to figure out how old the child was. It turns out that um, typical application of this problem, estimating age of a child from hand x-ray is less dramatic than this crime scene investigation I was picturing. It turns out that pediatricians use this to estimate whether or not a child is growing or developing normally. But uh, a non-end-to-end -end approach to this would be we look at an image and then you segment out or recognize the bones. So you know, just try to figure out where is that bone segment, where is that bone segment, where is that bone segment, and so on. And then knowing the lengths of the different bones, you can sort of go to a lookup table showing the average bone lengths um, in a child's hand and then use that to estimate the child's age. And so this approach actually works pretty well. In contrast, if you were to go straight from the image to the child's age, then you would need a lot of data to do that directly. And as far as I know, this approach does not work as well today just because there isn't enough data to train this task in an end-to-end -end fashion. Whereas in contrast, you can imagine that by breaking down this problem into two steps, Step one is a relatively simple problem. Maybe you don't need that much data. Maybe you don't need that many X-ray images to segment out the bones. And task two, well, you know, by collecting statistics of a number of children's hands, you can also get decent estimates of that without too much data. So this multi-step approach seems, you know, promising. Maybe more promising than the end-to-end -end approach, at least until you can get more data for the end-to-end -end learning approach. So an end-to-end -end deep learning works. It can work really well, and it can really simplify the system and not require you to build so many hand-designed individual components. But it's also not panacea. It doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. In the next video, I'm going to show you a more systematic description of when you should and maybe when you shouldn't use end-to-end -end deep learning and how to piece together these complex machine learning systems. Okay, One of the most exciting ကြည့်ညလူလေးရှိရင်ဟာအဲ့ဒီဒီဘိုင်းဒီဘိုင်းအနလစ်ကိုတစ်နေရာနှုတ်ထားလေးစတိုက်လေးတယ်ဆို
ဒီမှာဖိုင်းလိုင်းနေပရော့ဆိုတော့ဒီမှာပိုင်းလိုင်းနေပရော့ဆိုတော့ဒီမှာပိုင်းလိုင်းနေပရော့ဆိုတော့
ဒီလမ်းကြီးကြီးကိုနာတော့ထရန်ဆလိုတဲ့ခါကြာရင်ပေါ့เนาะဒီလမ်းကြီးဖတ်မှာတော့တက်အနလိစစ်လုပ်တ
Ini ni ayah sih, mana dia? Malay itu lo, masuk itu lo, betul tak? Alah, tuan meja lo. Alah, meja lo. Meja, meja, meja. Wah, data ni, aduh alat alat data ni ada, aduh alat alat. Okay, data ni, let's show you you pemain picture expression macam ni betul tak? Data, ni kan data ni ni, let's show deep learning macam mana data ni alat kau ni, deep deep. Dia ni juga machine learning macam data deep learning macam kau ni, ni proses ni lalu hajar ni dia. Ini nak lalang gua macam ni, wah, di kelas ni kalau macam ni betul tak? Betul betul hajar ni proses baru mana? Deep learning era macam ni, data ni alat tu data aja aja hangui cerita mana? Kau mana yang kau tak beli dua barang? Lepas tu dia dah menyiam, dia dah menyiam, dia dah naik. Masa ni lama aku nolong dia nyiam si malay. Kau dah kau, kalau semua orang dah naik, gua dia kau 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 lama dah bapak dia suruh naik malay. Kau dia dah naik lebih si biru, gua sah sah naik biru. Bapak lama memang kau. Lepas tu kau, kau mana dia naik lebih si merah? Kau dia mesti beli di entah orang kalau melayu kau, dia bahagia tuan itu tu boleh. Kau mana dia naik si nak gua sah naik dia kalau itu benda naik itu dah terlepas. Gua jangan rasa lalu lalu dia boleh. Kau mana dia naik lebih si nak lebih dulu melayu. Kau dia dah naik lebih si nak gua itu awal lagi. Kau dia dah naik lebih dia dah naik awal lagi. เนี่ยเช่นอะไรมาไหมโอเคป่ะชาวดูเดียวคนนี้เอ๊ะสักนาเลยตัวที่เดียวใครนาเลยมึงบุลันเดียวลงมาเลยมึงจะเชียร์เ
will be more able to capture whatever statistics are in the data rather than being forced to reflect human preconceptions. So for example, in the case of speech recognition, earlier speech systems had this notion of a phoneme, which was a basic units of sound, like cut, ah, and ta, for the word cat. And I think that phonemes are an artifact created by human linguists. Um, I actually think that phonemes are a fantasy of linguists that are a reasonable description of language, but it's not obvious that you want to force your learning algorithm to think in phonemes. And if you let your learning algorithm learn whatever representation it wants to learn, rather than forcing your learning algorithm to use phonemes as a representation, then its overall performance might end up being better. The second benefit of end-to-end -end deep learning is that there's less hand designing of components needed. Mm. And so this could also simplify your design workflow, that you just don't need to spend a lot of time hand designing features, hand designing these intermediate representations. How about the disadvantages? Here are some of the cons. First, it may need a large amount of data. So to learn this X to Y mapping directly, you might need a lot of data of X comma Y. And we've seen in the previous video some examples of where you could obtain a lot of data for subtasks, um, such as for face recognition. You could find a lot of data for finding a face in the image, as well as identifying the face once you found the face. But there was just less data available for the entire end-to-end -end task. So, you know, X, this is the uh, input end of the end-to-end -end learning, and Y is the output end. And so you need a lot of data, x, y, with both the input end and the output end in order to train some of these systems. And this is why we call it end-to-end -end learning, right? As well, uh, because you're learning a direct mapping from one end of the system, you know, all the way to the other end of the system. The other disadvantage is that it excludes potentially useful hand design components. So, Machine learning researchers tend to speak disparagingly of hand designing things, but if you don't have a lot of data, then your learning algorithm doesn't have that much insight it can gain from your data if your training set is small. And so hand designing a component can really be a way for you to inject manual knowledge into the algorithm. And that's not always a bad thing. I think of a learning algorithm as having two main sources of knowledge. One is the data, and the other is whatever you hand design, be it components or features or other things. And so when you have a ton of data, it's less important to hand design things. But when you don't have much data, then having a carefully hand designed system can actually allow humans to inject a lot of knowledge about a problem into, a, into an algorithm. And that can actually be very helpful. So one of the downsides of end-to-end -end deep learning is that it excludes potentially useful hand design components. And hand design components could be very helpful if well designed. They could also be harmful if it really limits your performance, such as if you force an algorithm to think in phonemes when maybe it could have discovered a better representation by itself. So it's kind of a double edged sword that could hurt or help, but it does tend to help more. Hand design components tend to help more when you're training on a small training set. So if you're building a new machine learning system and you're trying to decide whether or not to use end-to-end -end deep learning, I think the key question is, do you have sufficient data to learn a function with the complexity needed to map from X to Y? I don't have a formal definition of this phrase, complexity needed, but intuitively, if you're trying to learn a function from X to Y, that is, looking at an image like this and recognizing the position of the bones in this image, then maybe this seems like a relatively simple problem to identify the bones in the image, and maybe you don't need that much data for that task. Well, given a picture of a person, maybe finding the face of that person in the image doesn't seem like that hard a problem. So maybe you don't need too much data to find the face of a person, or at least maybe you can find enough data to solve that task. Whereas in contrast, the function needed to look at a hand and map that directly to the age of a child, that seems like a much more complex problem that intuitively maybe you need more data to learn if you were to apply a pure end-to-end -end 
deep learning approach. So let me finish this video with a more complex example. Um, you might know that I've been spending time helping out an autonomous driving company, Drive.ai. So I'm actually very excited about autonomous driving. So how do you build a car that drives itself? Well, here's one thing you could do, and this is not an end-to-end -end deep learning approach. You can take this input, an image of what's in front of your car, um, maybe radar, LiDAR, other sensor readings as well, but you know, to simplify the description, uh, let's just say you take a picture of what's in front of what's around your car, and then to drive your car safely, you need to detect other cars, and you also need to detect pedestrians. You need to detect other things, of course, uh, but we'll just present a simplified example here. Having figured out where are the other cars and pedestrians, you then need to plan your own route. So in other words, if you see where the other cars, where the pedestrians, you need to decide how to steer your own car, what path to steer your own car for the next several seconds. And then having decided that you're going to drive a certain path, maybe if this is a um, top-down view of a road, you know, that's your car, maybe you've decided to drive that path, that's what the path of what, what the route is, then you need to execute this by generating the appropriate steering as well as acceleration and braking commands. So in going from your image or your sensor inputs to detecting cars and pedestrians, that can be done pretty well using deep learning. But then having figured out where the other cars and pedestrians are going to you know, select this route to exactly how you want to move your car, usually that's not done with deep learning. Instead, that's done with a piece of software called um, motion planning. And if you ever take a class in robotics, you learn about motion planning. And then having decided what's the path you want to steer your car through, there'll be some other algorithm, I'm going to say it's a control algorithm, that then generates the exact decision, uh, that then decides exactly how much to turn the steering wheel and how much to step on the accelerator or step on the brake. So I think what this example illustrates is that you want to use machine learning or use deep learning to learn some individual components And when applying supervised learning, you should carefully choose what types of X, Y mappings you want to learn, depending on what tasks you can get data for. And in contrast, it is exciting to talk about a pure end-to-end -end deep learning approach where you input an image and directly output the steering. But given data availability and the types of things we can learn with neural networks today, this is actually not the most promising approach. Um, or this is not an approach that I think teams have gotten to work best. And I think this is actually, this pure end-to-end -end deep learning approach is actually less promising than um, more sophisticated approaches like this, given the availability of data and our ability to train new networks today. So that's it for end-to-end -end deep learning. It can sometimes work really well, but you also have to be mindful of where you apply end-to-end -end deep learning. Finally, thank you and congrats on making it this far with me. If you finished last week's videos and this week's videos, then I think you'll already be much smarter and much more strategic and much more able to make good prioritization decisions in terms of how to move forward on your machine learning project, uh, even compared to a lot of machine learning engineers and researchers that I see here in Silicon Valley. So congrats on all you've learned so far, and um, I hope you now also take a look at this week's homework problems, which will give you another opportunity to practice these ideas and make sure that you're mastering them. Oh, Bobby, oh, Bobby. Wow, no, that's a little genial. Could be very helpful. Now, you know, 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 you
ပုံမှန်တိုင်းမဲ့သွားပေါ့เนาะဖြစ်ချာအစ်ရွက်လုပ်သားတော့ပြီးပါကိုစပ်ပန်စပ်ပေါ့เนาะလည်းမျိုး
ไอ้ไอ้ตัวเป็นน่ะลงชื่อใหญ่บ่ขนาดไม่ทาวน์หมดแล้วเดี๋ยวจะไอ้ไปเลยได้ชื่อตัวไอ้ไม่ไปเล
mana tu jodin alam, alam bawa di mana saya, di 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 dalam di belanda itu orang 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 individu orang 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 Kau yang ini wah bahagian tu nih, so kau carefully choose lupa, mana dua ibu, mana di mana susun. Kau di dalam lau berkuat lalu tu nih, sah sah tu abang ngah image tu abang ngah kau sih bawa lalu kalau dua macam jauh, nalar jodoh hari tu nih jodoh hari tu tu boleh bawa. Di hari ni berdebu jodoh hari tu, nalar kau dah macam kongresi sih sekarang jodoh hari tu bawa. Kau okay, di 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 orang jodoh hari tu, nalar orang lekang kongresi mana le, lalu tu nalar dia tu jodoh nih di hari biwa mana mana orang ni malay jodoh ya. Di sini kau beli macam sih engineer sih orang kau nene tawa macam tu jodoh orang ni lalu jodoh macam sih engineer sih dia kau nampu jodoh nama mana kau ya. Nah, dalam 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 list itu kau ni macam sih macam ni, dah jadi nanti ni ni aku international ni tu alu jari, bukan? Ni ni mesti dia hari kan sekarang jadi aku abis lulus ni sebab neti ni, kalau ni hari ni lepas ni lepas, bukan? Kalau macam ni ni problem ni mah, tunggu jadi sih mah, bukan? Dia nampak di eh hari lepas hari soal ni, di hari ni sebab tunggu kos ni, tunggu nanti kau, nanti lepas ni mah lepas ni mah lepas ni, yang cuci bawah ni, cuci tengah ni, bukan? Kau sih ni sih lah, sih tu kau yang jual apa? Nah, ni sebab tunggu nampak bau, bukan? Nah, ni sebab April dua ratus lah, April macam bau, April pagi lah tu. Tangan ni, ni sebab dua ratus lah, sah, April pagi lah. ไม่มีหรอกที่ไฟเนี่ยเล่นเบลล์มองเล่นเบลล์เบลล์จอยนะโอ้โหเอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ้เอ